Why did I bring this up? Well, back in 2015, who remembers when Trump made his announcement to run for president? I know Timothy does. <laughs> but in his, in his uh, announcement, Donald Trump said this. He said, when Mexico, he's talking about people coming from different countries into the United States. And he said, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Right? I don't know how you felt when you heard those words or if you heard about how he had said these words, but many, many people were outraged. Right? Many people were, were outraged, especially those on the other side, on the left. And indeed, a lot of us are either immigrants or descendants of immigrants, right? My parents immigrated here in the 1970s, so I'm, I'm only here because my parents immigrated here. So if he's talking about immigrants, people coming into the United States, or in our case, coming into Canada, then that's pretty offensive. Because he's implying, or at least it seems like he's implying, that many of these immigrants are bad people and bringing lots of crime and terrible things into our country. So I have to, we have to ask this question. Does Canada belong to a particular group of people? Or does it belong to people of all ethnicities? And anyone from around the world should be welcomed into our country. Is that fair? What's the answer to that question? Who does Canada belong to? Right? Have you ever thought about that? I know I never thought about it really until the past few years when this idea of immigration has become, become such a, a hot topic. Obviously the idea of immigration and the debate about immigration has been something that's been going on for decades, but it's really become a hot topic since Donald Trump made those statements four years ago. So I say that the question of immigration is a legitimate question. It's, it's a legitimate discussion to have. But it raises an interesting point, right? Because if you happen to have an opinion that we shouldn't allow certain people into this country, then you are likely to be accused of being hateful, that you actually hate your neighbor, right? Whenever immigration is discussed, often if you don't agree that we should let everyone in, then you are accused of being xenophobic. Xenophobia is a word that means fear of strangers, fear of foreigners. That's what, literally what it means. <laughs> so the idea is, if you don't want mass immigration from other countries, especially certain countries, well then you must be fearful of those people. That you have, in fact, an irrational fear of those people. That you are, something's wrong with you. Right? But the, here's the thing. The people who have that view that we shouldn't let everyone in, are, I think, indeed fearful, but they're fearful of what will happen if people who have a different culture come into our country and bring that different culture. And don't become a part of all, our culture, and then suddenly there's a conflict between these cultures. And then there is the issue of illegal immigration. You know the difference, right? One is what my parents did, which is they legally came here. They went through all of the legal process to become uh, a part of Canada and eventually become Canadian citizens. And so that I was able to, me and two of my siblings were able to be born here in Canada. And therefore, I'm a Canadian citizen by birth. It only happened because my parents legally came here. Very grateful for that, right? But illegal immigration is this. Finding some way to sneak into the country and being a part of the society in some way, and in fact benefiting from society in some way, but without ever going through that, that legal process to become a genuine legal citizen. So, why shouldn't people be able to do that? What's the, what's the big deal? Who cares if people come in legally or illegally? Shouldn't everybody be welcome into our country? Here's the thing. We're not actually going to focus on this today. I hope, I hope you don't understand. I'm bringing this up to raise the question in our minds of who is our neighbor. Right? Are we called to love anyone and everyone? Is that fair? Or should we be discriminating in who we love? 
Well, I do believe that we are called to love our neighbor. I think we established that last week. I, I don't think it's going to take too much more convincing to say that the Bible calls on all of us as Christians to love our neighbor. Right? There it is right there in Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. He said, I am the Lord because he's saying, I'm giving you this commandment. This is not just an opinion or, or you know, an option. This is what you must do if you want to be a part of God's people. You have to love your neighbor. Right? And, and in fact, if you don't love God and if you don't love your neighbor, everything falls apart. Love is the point. If you don't love God and don't love fellow people, then, in fact, you can't rely on anything good happening. That's the foundation of a good society. It's the foundation of how we get anything positive done. But further to that, it's actually the foundation of our salvation. There was an exchange in Luke chapter 10, and you can read this again later if you'd like, that an expert in the law of the Torah came up to Jesus and asked him this question. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Right? This expert in the law knew the Bible, knew the, 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 the Torah, and he asked Jesus, what is it that I need to do in order to make sure that I'm a part of the kingdom of God and to have eternal life? And I think Jesus' answer is quite shocking, quite amazing. He doesn't say, well, make sure you believe in me. He doesn't say, make sure you believe in the cross. Of course, those are essential and, and important. But what he actually says is, well, what is written in the Torah? How does it read to you? Jesus actually is saying, back to this expert in the law, he's saying, well, you know that the answer is in the Torah, don't you? So what is the answer? He puts the question back on him. And the, the man says, well, love God and love your neighbor. That's what I have to do. And guess what Jesus said? You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus actually said, if you love God, and if you love your neighbor, then you will live. You will have eternal life. Right? He's actually commenting on a verse from Leviticus 18 that uh, a lot of the other rabbis would point to as, as, as proof that if you do God's commandments, if you obey God, then you can be sure that you will have eternal life. It comes from Leviticus 18.5, which says, God said, you shall keep my statutes and my, judg my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. I am the Lord. See what, he's, what, what, what they're getting at there? If you do God's commandments, if you love God and if you love your neighbor, you will live. And Jesus says, eternally, right? You will have eternal life. Okay. All right. We buy into that, right? Love God, love your neighbor. Sounds good. That's what we're going to live our lives by. We're going to try to obey those commandments, right? But who is my neighbor? If you're supposed to love your neighbor, then who is my neighbor? Right? We should know. Otherwise, we're not going to be living out what, to Jesus, is a part of what brings us eternal life. So, in the context of who is my neighbor, you'll recall that what we said last week about love your neighbor as yourself was given to the nation of Israel. So it referred to loving your fellow Israelites, right? Let's say you're, you're, you're an Israelite living back in the days of, of even Jesus, but even back before. Well, your duty was to love your fellow Israelites. That's how you would be obeying the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. But is that enough? It's interesting that right there, in the same chapter, Leviticus 19, the same chapter where it says, love your neighbor as yourself, it also says that the stranger who resides among you, you shall be, shall be to you as the native among you. You shall love him as yourself. Do you see that? God commanded Israel to not only love their fellow Israelites, love your neighbor as yourself, your fellow citizens, if you will. He also said... You're to love the stranger who is among you, who, who chooses to come and live among you. You're to love him as yourself as well. That broadens it a bit, right? It's not just those who are like you, those who are your own race or nationality, but it's also those who have chosen to come and live among you, right? But it's interesting. This, I, this word that's translated here as stranger eventually became 
or came to be understood by the Jewish people as a convert to Judaism. Meaning, it wasn't just any kind of stranger. It was somebody who said, I don't want to live like the rest of the world. I want to live like you guys, the Jewish people. So, in a sense, they narrowed it back down again, right? That's the tendency that we have as human beings, is to only want to love those who are like us, right? To love our fellow citizens, our fellow people who are like us, right? So love your neighbor as yourself and love the stranger who becomes like you, is what they did, right? But that didn't stop there being people who weren't like them. In fact, we find all throughout the history of Israel that they had conflicts with one another, right? They had conflicts with one another. They had conflicts between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had conflicts between the Sadducees and the people and the common people. Or what about the Essenes who, who said, forget all of you guys, we're going out into the wilderness and we're going to live on our own. They didn't get along with one another. There was another group of people that they didn't get along with either. The Samaritans. Who were the Samaritans? Well, if you recall, back in the days, hundreds of years before Jesus, during the days of Solomon and, and previous to that, David, Israel was a united nation, right? They had one nation of Israel. But then after Solomon, the nation was split into two. You had the northern kingdom of Israel. You can kind of see it here. This is more reflective of how it looked later. But the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And the capital city of Judah is what? Jerusalem, right? But the capital city of Samaria, of, oh, I just gave it away. The capital city of northern Israel became what? Samaria, right? <laughs> so Samaria became the capital city of this northern kingdom. But guess what? A few hundred years later, still before Jesus, but a few hundred years after the split, the Assyrians came and conquered that northern kingdom. So suddenly you had a foreign power coming in and taking over that, that northern country, that northern part of the country. What happened was, suddenly the Israelites and the Assyrians became mixed. Both literally, they started to intermarry, and, and so therefore you no longer had pure Israelites, you had this new kind of, uh, uh, of person, uh, a mix between an Assyrian person and an Israelite. But what came with that was a mixing of culture as well, right? You didn't just have the, 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 the religion of Israel that you had in Jerusalem. You had this new hybrid, right? They still worshiped God, but they did it in ways that was different. So the Jews from the southern kingdom did not get along with the Samaritans, right? Samaritans. Because they, they felt that they had betrayed them in that sense, right? They had gone astray. And the Samaritans didn't like the Jews because they thought that they were better than them that they were the true people of God, right? So it's very, very interesting that when Jesus is asked by that scholar, by that Torah expert, who is my neighbor, that he then tells us this story. And I found an old clip to, hope to, to, to illustrate it. This, who remembers McGee and me? Anybody remember that? Is that just, yeah. It, it's a, a Christian kids thing back when I was a kid, way long ago. So... Let's just watch this summary of the Good Samaritan, and then I'll explain it a little further. I think that's just a fun and humorous way to, to illustrate the story, right? I, I, I hope most of us are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan, this, this little story that Jesus told to try to illustrate who is my neighbor, right? There is a Jewish man who's walking on this dangerous road, and suddenly he's overtaken by robbers. Robbers beat him up and take his money and, and leave him for dead, right? A priest comes, the priests, the sons of Aaron, the priests are supposed to be the, 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 the best of Israel, the people of good character. They were the Sadducees, actually. So it was probably a Sadducee who showed up and, and who came and looked at him, didn't want to touch him. Maybe he thought he was dead and he would have become ritually unclean and he wouldn't have been able to go and do his priestly duty, right? So he just ignores him and walks by. The Levite then comes who's also a temple worker and, and, and comes and also doesn't help. So for whatever reason, they ignore the man. But guess what? Love your neighbor as yourself is a commandment. And they didn't keep it. 
So then a Samaritan comes, somebody who's like this half Israelite mix, not a pure Israelite in any sense, and they didn't get along. The, the Jewish person wouldn't have liked the Samaritan, the Samaritan wouldn't have liked the Jewish person. But the Samaritan had compassion on the Jewish man who was beaten up, right? So that's fascinating that Jesus would take the time to say that there was a Samaritan who did what was right, who had compassion, even though he wouldn't have considered that Jewish man his neighbor, his brother, right? His fellow. And so when we finish the story here between that, that Torah scholar and Jesus, Jesus asks, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And then the Torah scholar said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And that's right, right? It was the one who showed mercy. That's how you know if a person is your neighbor. That's how you know if you have an obligation to another, right? It's not about whether they're like you or not, whether you share or agree with them on everything. It's whether or not you can act in love towards them. Is that possible to do with each and every person out there? Maybe not all the time, but most of the time, yes. Right? We have the ability to act in a way that is like Jesus, showing God's love to them. And you know, group identity is very, very important. It's a, it's a legitimate part of human nature, of human life, right? The very first thing that we do is we find our identity and then we put that in terms of a group, right? You know where I'm going with this? The very first thing we do is we realize, hey, I'm a child of these two people, right? Uh, Timothy is starting to get, get his identity in such a way where he understands that he's mine and Sarah's child, right? And then eventually, once he grows a little older, he's going to understand that he belongs, there's that word belongs, he belongs to, that, to our family. So that's where we get our identity, or how we, how we evolve our identity, to see ourselves as something that is a part of something bigger, right? And as we grow older, we see ourselves part of the community, we see ourselves part of a country, or some of us might even see ourselves part of a certain race, right? We know that, that, that Italian people are proud people, right? So, okay, I'm proud to be Italian in that sense. Or I'm proud to be Canadian. I'm proud to live in Canada and to be, have been born here and to, to live out in this culture. We identify ourselves in some group way, right? Or what about then you move on. On top of that, you have some other group association. We all identify as Christians who are part of a church, right? That's a group identity. Whatever it is. Right? Every single person has some kind of identity that they associate with a group. It's perfectly normal. But here's where the danger comes in. When you start doing that, and you start seeing the people who are in the other group as the enemy. Right? They're different. They don't agree with us. Therefore, they're the enemy. And I'm not going to love them. I'm not going to be compassionate towards them. Do you think that that is what God wants from us? Do you think that's the, the model that Jesus showed? Of course not. So let me say this, just to sort of touch on the earlier discussion, but really in a broader sense. Borders are normal. Borders are healthy, right? We do have a message of love and mercy to everyone, right? That's the message of the gospel, is that God loves everyone, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from. doesn't matter. But borders are healthy. Now, I'm not even talking about national borders. I'm talking about our own borders. You recall that I said a few weeks ago that it is perfectly healthy to have borders or boundaries in your own life. And if people are toxic and they're not treating you well, you have every right to say, I'm excluding you from my life. Right? We do that as a church. Right? We are a welcoming, loving church. I don't think there's been ever an incident in the past five years right, where, where we treated anybody badly or poorly when they came into our church. But guess what? If somebody came into our church and was actively working against our, our purposes as a church, 
we would have to kindly tell them to leave, right? It's only fair. We have boundaries as a group, as a church. Well, a nation is not too, too different than that, right? We have certain purposes as a nation, and if you're actively working against those purposes, then you can't be a part of that country. But guess what? Borders have to be more, have to be, borders are legitimate, borders are fine, but they have to be more than simply arbitrary things. I want us to think about something. Have you ever wondered why the border between Niagara Falls, Ontario, and Niagara Falls, New York? Why there? Why along that river? In a sense, it's arbitrary. It doesn't have to be there, right? It, doesn't, it could be before and after. It doesn't matter. So here's the thing. And, and, look, and get this. Frank, too bad they're not here today. Franklin and Viola do not let that border stop them from being a part of our church. It's actually a wonderful illustration to tell us that sometimes borders are somewhat arbitrary. And we must be seeking after the borders that are more legitimate. You know what? I would take anyone from anywhere in the world to be my brother and sister in Christ if they have truly devoted themselves to the Lord, have repented of their sin, and are working just like we are to become people who are people of good character and virtue. I don't care what background they're from, what race they are, what, whatever they do, right? If they are endeavoring to be on this same journey of faith that, that we're trying to be on, then they're my brother and sister. They're my tribe. They're my, my people, right? My country is not necessarily Canada, though I am grateful to be a citizen of Canada, and I respect the laws of Canada, right? But my country is the kingdom of God. Does that resonate with any of you? That we, we are, have our allegiance to a greater country, and that is the kingdom of God. And that's what we're striving for. So what is the ethic of the kingdom, right? The ethic of Jesus and of the kingdom of God, the way we live our lives is we love our neighbor. And as Jesus taught us in today's message and, and in this passage we looked at, our neighbor is not just those who are like us. Our neighbor is even those we disagree with or they disagree with us or are different from us. So I want us to close our service this morning. And guess what? Next week we're going to talk about something that's even harder than that, which is the call to love our enemies. Right? Not just those who are different and disagree with us, but those who are actively against us. That's even tougher. <laughs> but we're going to look at that next week. Let's have Paul come. We're going to sing God of this city because we want to follow Jesus's we want to follow the example and call of Jesus to be someone who, who loves our community and loves those in our community. And we can do that by singing and praying. More importantly, praying. It's one of the next steps. Praying for our city, for our community.